I wanted to start with a story. Uh, I was in Nigeria recently, up in the northeast in Adamina State, which is right uh, where the Boko Haram extremist group has been operating for the past seven years. And uh, I wanted to visit a village that had actually been a bit more resilient to the ravages of Boko Haram, which has displaced about 2.4 million people, killed tens of thousands, we don't know exactly, maybe 40 or 50,000 people. And so I went to the small visit of Gombe, which is just outside the capital of Yola in Adamawa. And I met with a group of this small community, and they had actually successfully fought off the efforts of Boko Haram to come in and take over their village. So they were an interesting example of communities being bit, a bit more resilient in the face of those kinds of incursions. They had gathered their hunters together, and when they saw members of Boko Haram come near them, uh, they would, they would fight them off, they would capture them. And in fact, they told me, if they captured a Boko Haram member, they had the option of turning it over to the local police, the, the individual. But then they figured out, well, you know, that the police will be bribed uh, by the Boko Haram, and the next day Boko Haram individuals will come back and be an even greater threat to their communities. And they're telling me this, and they said, so we just shoot them. And to me, that, that, that's the capsule of what fragility is. Both the fountain of what uh, spawned Boko Haram to begin with, marginalized people in a marginalized part of the country that comes into contact with um, ideologies that harnesses those grievances. So you have the turmoil um, and the terror of Northeast Nigeria and a citizenry that has deep distrust of their, of their own government, where they have no hope of the local authorities providing them opportunities or securities, and the social contract that Daniel just mentioned is deeply broken. And so the question is, how, how do you build that back up? How do we understand what the pathway is out of that level of fragility? And that's one of the primary uh, global threats that we face today with fragility as, as really the common denominator um, of many of the steepest global challenges that we face today. We've been looking at photographs um, through dinner of uh, people who are displaced, people who are uh, in cities that have been bombed. Everybody has seen the news over the last several years of the record number of people who are displaced by violent conflict. We're up to 68 now, 68 million people who are pushed out of their homes by violent conflict. That's like all of Texas, all of California, all of Maryland combined. Um, I have been doing this work for a little over almost 25 years. And when I started doing this work, 80% of our global humanitarian assistance went to people who were victims of natural disaster. Now, 80% of our humanitarian assistance goes to people who are victims of violent conflict. And what we see, because of the research of people like the Pearson Institute, is that that fragility is the source, not just of violent conflict, but that we see um, uh, the majority of refugees and migrants are coming from those countries that are highest up on the list of any fragility index. Uh, the four civil wars that we've seen uh, come to the fore in the last five years, the four countries that have been teetering on the edge of famine for the past three years, uh, one in 1.6 billion people uh, who live in extreme poverty around the world, um, the top sources of extremism, of violent extremism, all of these are concentrated in countries that are deemed to be the most fragile. And they're deemed to be fragile because of a variety of indicators that cluster around social, economic, security um, aspects uh, that have been all the result of a decade and a half of significant scholarship and learnings. So we've got some excellent research underlining 
a better understanding of fragility, especially as we've seen this issue um, push forward some of, this, some of these big global challenges that we're all grappling with. Um, we are um, also seeing that this is happening at a time where uh, it's not just a humanitarian issue, but it's a security issue. And I want to underline that because one of the challenges that we have is that fragility has been more or less in the development conversation. So the development world and the academic world has been seized with, with fragility, with the suffering that it's caused, um, with the civil wars and the famines, but it is also deeply a security issue. And we need these ideas and these concepts to be fully embraced by our security world and by our diplomatic world. Um, so that there's a shared understanding of what the problems are and therefore what we can do about it. Um, Daniel gave us a good definition of fragility. Um, I would just add to the fact that when the social contract is broken between societies uh, and their governments, uh, it does lead to the kind of, of, of fragmentation that most of these most fragile countries are characterized by. And I think probably without going to the scholarship or seeing the many indices that really rank order in greater detail what these countries are, you could name what the most fragile countries are. It's Yemen, it's Syria, it's Afghanistan, it's uh, South Sudan, it's Nigeria. I mean, it's, uh, it's a list that is sadly all too familiar. So the good news is that there's an emerging consensus on what is fragility, the, the way that it is driving a lot of these global threats. And the scholarship that has been done over the past year, really the past years, um, has both consolidated learnings, it's named it, it's brought people together to look at what are the roots, what are the drivers, how can we better understand this, um, there have been uh, important uh, emerging consensus around what are the antidotes? How do we do things differently so that we can address fragility more effectively? And you'll hear about that on the panel. The fragility commission that Adnan worked on with David Cameron uh, really consolidated some of the core principles. Uh, you have at your table several of the publications that we've done at USIP that consolidate these core principles. It's understanding that ultimately fragile states need to come to these issues with local ownership, that they um, need to have uh, more sustained, coherent efforts from the international community, and that there needs to be uh, an ability to bring the security, the diplomatic, and the development actors together uh, more effectively. So there's all this shared consensus. There's this great scholarship. So it brings me to the question of why aren't we better able to tackle this big challenge. And I would posit that we continue to be greatly challenged by our own bureaucratic impediments, um, that we're still challenged by uh, this fragmentation, both within the United States and with our international partners. And it's hard, it's politics at the center, and ultimately getting local uh, actors to have the incentives to act differently is a tough challenge. Um, but I want to end with a call to action because I do think we have an extraordinary opportunity right now. U.S. Institute of Peace uh, has been asked uh, by the U.S. Congress, which founded and funded USIP, to form a task force on looking at the roots of extremism in fragile states. This uh, was, is now being chaired by the two co-chairs, uh, Congressman Hamilton and Governor Kane, who were also the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission. They see this as the unfinished business that they started uh, when they did the 9-11 Commission. One of the core recommendations they made when their report came out was to put together a preventive strategy so that we would get ahead of violent extremism overseas. This was the, and they see this current task force as the unfinished business 
from that effort. And in fact, uh, in 2001, there were about 2,000 attacks by violent extremism. Uh, fast forward to 2017, and there were more than 10,000. So that problem has proliferated as we've seen this rise in conflict within fragile states. Um, that task force issued their interim findings uh, on 9-11, and final recommendations will come out at the end of the year, or, or early next year. And I raise this because there is a flurry of effort right now. The, the Fragility Commission, there's legislation right now in both the House and Senate. There was a new act passed called the BUILD Act that looks at bringing together U.S. capabilities for better finance in fragile states. Um, there is some good energy that's out there, but it does require that there, rem that there is a deeper bench of interest in these issues and that there is support not just in the policy world and in the research and academic world, but that this translates into political action here in our country. And so for those of you here in this room who, who are involved with these issues, who are interested in these issues, make sure that you're also supporting political action on these issues because that's what it will take for us to do business differently. And it's more important than ever, not just because of the rising conflict deaths that have happened over the last decade in countries that are consumed with conflict within themselves, but at a time where we're seeing, once again, the rise of regional and international power competition, which is further complicating and prolonging the conflicts that are occurring within fragile states that are vulnerable to the predations of outside powers. So even as the world's attention and as our U.S. attention goes back to the world, the Cold War world of great power conflict problems, and we start re-engaging with state-to-state -state conflict, we can't forget that the majority of deaths that 68 million people are still the result of the conflicts that are happening within states that will only be further complicated um, as we move into this next era, however it further uh, finally is defined. So with that, I'm delighted to be a part of the panel discussion uh, and look forward to how we take this conversation. Daniel.